So we come to the beginning of the afternoon session. Uh, and it begins with the Galton Lecture, which has been given annually since 1914 and is always one of the high points of the annual conference. This year, it's entitled Patterns of Consanguineous Marriage Across the World and Their Consequences. And it's going to be given by Professor Alan Bittles, who's already been advertised um, in the other talks. Um, so Alan was educated at Trinity College Dublin, followed by a PhD at Queen's University Belfast, which was awarded in 1973. Um, and he is now the uh, adjunct professor and research leader at the Center for Comparative Genomics at Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia. And he's also honorary professor of community genetics at Edith Cowan University, where he was a uh, foundation professor of human biology and director of the center for human genetics from 1993 to 2005. Previously, um, he was reader in human biology at King's College London and also chair of the Board of Studies in Genetics at the University of London. So I think you'll notice he actually does not have an Australian accent. It doesn't seem to, to me anyway. Um, Professor Bittles is very eminent, and he has published more than 250 refereed research papers, <laughs> books, and book chapters. And he's also very widely traveled in his academic capacity, having been a visiting senior fellow at the universities of Cambridge, Duke, La Trobe, Beijing, Stanford, and Umea. And um, he's been a senior Fulbright fellow at the University of Michigan and uh, Walker Ames professor at the University of Washington. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, the Royal College of Pathologists, the Royal Society of Medicine, and uh, of the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, in addition to all this, uh, or um, because of all these activities, he has also served uh, as a member of several WHO expert panels, for example, on medical genetic services in developing countries. Uh, and from 2008 to 2010, he was an invited member of um, expert groups uh, contributing to the um, study on global burden of disease. <laughs> Uh, and then um, he's also a, a member of a WHO panel on grand challenges uh, in genomics from public health in developing countries. Because, of course, the uh, whole scene is now changing with the um, advent of easier genomics and more available genomics all, all around the globe. His current work centers on rare diseases, including hemoglobinopathies, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and the impact of consanguinity and genetic substructure on deleterious gene expression. And he's got projects on, in these areas in Australia, Brazil, India, Pakistan, Iran, and the UK. We're really delighted to welcome Alan to give the Galton Lecture, uh, and as is quite customary with such named lectures. There are not going to be formal um, questions after this talk, because there will be a presentation. Uh, and uh, then you can talk to him at tea time. Thank you. Alan. Well, thank you very much indeed, Madam President, for that introduction and to the trustees of the Galton Institute for their kind invitation to come here today and talk with you. It really is a very, very considerable honor. The title is here, so without further ado, I'll progress. And I start with a slide from William Wilde in 1854. William Wilde has got many reasons to be famous. He was an ophthalmologist. He ran the uh, <coughs> census of Ireland in 1851. And of course, he was the father of the rather more famous now, Oscar, who was actually born in 1854, the year his father published this book on the physical, moral, and social condition of the deaf and dumb. Now, the interesting thing to me is that this was very far-sighted because 
what he was looking at, factors to be considered in assessing death mutism, the proportion of the sexes, their education, susceptibility to education, the social class, disease, the localities, geological factors, soil aspect, etc., 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 and then right down at the bottom, or the consanguinity of parents. So this was a nice start. And when he did the study, 1851, the study was conducted. The first census was actually conducted in 1841. So this was the second one in Great Britain and Ireland. The census population was 6.55 million, death mutes 4,747, and there were 170 death mutes born to first, second, or third cousin. So 3.6% of the population, or the death mute population, were actually consanguineous. The interesting part was there was one thing that he didn't mention. You know, he went through insalubrity of climate, the educational factors, gender. Well, the one that he missed out was the fact that in the famine years 1846 to 51, there were one million deaths in Ireland due to TB, typhus, dysentery, or a lapsing fever. 1.3 million people migrated and there were 300,000 averted births, i.e. miscarriages. And yet, when he wrote the book and when he collected the data, there wasn't a single mention of the Irish famine, which I find quite extraordinary. And if there was such a thing in those days as an ethics committee, I know now an ethics committee, you said, I thought I'd look at death mutism and consanguinity in Ireland. Someone would have said, look, the th you've just lost 25% of the population. Think again, come back in a few years' time. But this was fairly typical and remains fairly typical of the attitudes people have towards consanguineous marriage. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're very happy to accept any data or any supposed data that gives a poor rap to consanguineous marriage. And the second one, this was in 1856 in the United States. The Reverend Charles Brooks, an Episcopalian minister, wrote this a paper for the ninth meeting of the AAAS, and it was on laws of reproduction considered with particular reference to intermarriage of first cousins. And what he concluded was the improvement and prosperity of thousands of families depends on its solution and, in a degree, the safety and elevation of society. Now, at that point in time in Massachusetts, there probably were about 3% cousin marriage, but it's, all of society is in, in danger and the proof that he gave for supposing that society was in danger, he, there are about 30 of these little case reports. I just put up two of them. So Mr. E.S. and wife of N. Massachusetts, her first cousin, both of sound mind and robust health, they had seven daughters and one son, three daughters are deranged, and the rest are nervous, which seems <laughs> fairly reasonable. And then Mr. E. of M. married his first cousin, they had five daughters and three sons, one daughter is an idiot, two are feeble-minded, one son has run away with the town's money. So obviously, <clears throat> consanguineous marriage is not a good idea. <laughs> and it comes up to the present day, these were probably about five years old, the then uh, MP, Anne Cryer for Keithley, writing in the Yorkshire Post, you know, about cousin marriage, cousin, they highlight the little words they want you to read so you don't have to bother reading the whole piece. So cousin marriage, you know, another cousin marriage, Pakistan, and the title of it, you know, how dangerous these things are, community questions over marriages that can leave a legacy of heartbreak. And then this gentleman, this jaunty looking fellow, who you may or may not uh, recognize, was actually the Minister of Immigration at one point and then the Minister for Environmental Matters. Um, before he was fairly unceremoniously dumped out of Parliament on the grounds that he had put out entirely false, spurious comments about his Liberal Democrat uh, opponent in the seat of Oldham. And, you know, he's talking about, well, sorry, you probably can't see it down here, but he talks about first cousin marrying being the elephant in the room. Yeah, you yeah, love these terms that people come out with. <coughs> And the latest one is, I think, the lady possibly that Neil Small referred to, Baroness Flather, who sits on the cross benches of the House of Lords. She trained and qualified as a barrister in the United Kingdom. Um, so you might expect 
that at least she would know that, sorry, the difference between first cousin marriage, which has been legal in England and Wales since the reign of Henry VIII, so about 1546, and incest. She's growing concern about <coughs> incest within Pakistani communities. Now, this is really outrageous. You know, if you're going to show your ignorance, for goodness sake, go somewhere else and do it. But this, if you're a member of the Pakistani community and you're being told that, oh, there's a lot of incest in your community, and this was in the Daily Telegraph, which everyone obviously believes everything they say, <laughs> but it really is very, very poor. And as Neil said, apparently, he was then contacted by the BBC. Could he give his opinion on this? Out of this silly person making these silly comments and without any evidence, without a shred of evidence, even on it. Now, why do I think that there's a good reason that consanguineous marriage and the adverse effects of consanguineous marriage have been very considerably overstated? Well, the first reason is that the populations of Europe, Asia, um, migrated out of Africa some 60 to 80,000 years ago, so about 2,500 to 3,000 generations, <coughs> somewhere of that nature. The estimates of the migrating human population, the total population leaving Africa, may have been as few as 700 <coughs> breeding adults to a, an optimum number, a maximum number of 10,000. And people were leaving Africa, not all one fell swoop playing tambourines and saying we're off on a, <coughs> on a jump to Europe or Asia, but rather that they went in small groups, they went in very small family groups, small nuclear family groups almost. So there must have been high levels of consanguinity, or if you want to use the I word, inbreeding. They, they had to be highly inbred, because the circumstances were such, the environmental circumstances were such, that it, it was important that as soon as a female became capable of pregnancy, pregnancy would ensue, because the average life expectancy, Lord knows, for those who survived to five years of age, was probably no more than 28, 30 years of age. So consanguineous relationships have been commonplace in humans for many, many generations, uh, going back certainly 60, 80,000 years. And you could even argue, if you wanted to, that it was quite beneficial to have these close relationships because you would have got purging of the gene pool and the removal of <coughs> deleterious recessive genes. And then if we go forward, we're now going back about 3,000 years to the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verses 7 to 18, where it states quite clearly who you're not allowed to marry, prohibited in the previous generation, the same generation, the following generation. It says nothing about first cousin marriage being prohibited. Indeed, it says nothing about uncle-niece marriage being prohibited. And so one would assume that the people of the book, i.e. the people of the Judaic religion, of Christianity, of the Islamic religion, more or less follow these guidelines with some quirks according to religion. And indeed, that's what you see when you look at the data. So that each, each religion has a breakout point. Um, but in Buddhism, except for Tibet, first cousin marriage is commonplace throughout Buddhism. The Tibetan Buddhists really try to avoid uh, cousin marriage uh, to a very large degree, but they do, and someone asked the question earlier, they do permit polyandry, where a woman will marry two or three, usually two or three brothers. So this is not unknown. It certainly is quite commonplace, apparently, in Tibet. In the Christianity, the Christian religions, in the Protestant religions, uh, first cousin marriage is, is freely permitted, probably with the exception of the Quakers. For some reason, in the 19th centuries, the Quakers decided against first cousin marriage. I've not, not been able to find out why, but I think you can take that as read. In the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches, the Orthodox church are very much against first or second cousin marriage. The Roman Catholic church, now you still have to get permission, diocesan permission, to marry your first cousin or a closer relative. Um, in the 11th, 12th century, due to a change in the way that people were actually counting the levels of consanguinity from a Roman method to a German method, in the 12th century, you couldn't marry your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth cousin without permission from the diocese. 
And this became, after a couple of generations, this obviously wasn't working. Uh, and they reverted back to three generations. And then in 1918, they cut back from third and second cousin marriages. You'd no longer need uh, diocesan permission, but first cousin marriage you do. Hinduism, again, you've got to divide between the South Indians and Dravidians, who will allow first cousin marriage, and particularly favor uncle-niece marriage, whereas in North India, the Indo-European, and of course, Baroness Flather is born in North India, actually in Lahore, in what is now Pakistan. She describes herself as an atheist Hindu. So she's got her North Indian Hindu prejudices against cousin marriage. If she'd been born in South India, she probably wouldn't have had those prejudices. But who knows, with someone like that. And the uh, Muslim religion, Judaism, Zoroastrian, Parsi, Confucian, all allow first cousin marriage. Sikhism, as a sort of offshoot of North Indian Hinduism, first cousin marriages are not allowed. And yet, in the some Sikh communities in Pakistan, first cousin marriage is perhaps 20%. The most common form, the closest form of, of mating, would of course be incest, so-called first degree, where the partners would share 50% of their genes. They would have 50% of their genes in common, inherited from both parents and from past generations. And so they would be homozygous at 25% of all gene loci, on average. Now, if of course you've had several generations of close inbreeding, then that figure may be well above 25%, but that would be very unusual. And in virtually every country in the world, every society, incest is both criminally and morally uh, a crime. It's, it, it's just, it just doesn't happen. Hence my slight outrage at Baroness Flather suggesting it was quite commonplace in the UK Pakistani community. Double half sib marriage is allowed under certain circumstances in countries like the Netherlands and Sweden. Um, double first cousin marriage is certainly permitted within Muslim societies, and that's where you've got two partners will have all four grandparents in common. But funnily enough, um, uncle niece marriage, which is allowed in uh, the head South Indian Hindus, isn't allowed in the Muslim communities, even though it's the same distance, genetic distance. But by far the most common form of consanguineous marriage is first cousin, where the partners will share or have 12.5% of their genes in common, and they'll be homozygous at 6.25% of loci. Once you start getting down to the second cousin, third cousin, then you're dealing with low levels of homozygosity. So we generally in medical terms would go second cousins or closer, would be consanguineous. As I've mentioned, uncle-niece marriage you get in South India and also in the Sephardic Jewish communities. So Jewish communities who were expelled from Spain and migrated back to the Middle East, um, so in Turkey, in Iran, in Iraq, uncle-niece marriage is moderately common, but nothing like the levels in South India where Certainly when we were working there in the 1980s, 1990s, it would be 20% uncle-niece marriage and about 10% first cousin marriage. Double first cousin marriage, very much a facet of Islamic societies in the Middle East and Pakistan. First cousin marriage, North Africa, Middle East, Central, South, Southeast, East Asia. But where I put asterisks, it would be cross cousin marriage only. So fathers, a man and his father's brother's daughter would be a typical Arab um, Islamic marriage, but that wouldn't be allowed in these other communities. They would regard that as akin to incest. So, you know, each community and each religion has its own sub-rules, rules and sub-rules, and you've just got to learn these and find out what's going on. And if you do a map of this uh, distribution of consanguineous marriage, the darkest colours, as in Sudan and going into the Middle East and parts of Pakistan, would be over 50% second cousin or closer marriage. As the colours lighten, you're dealing with 20-30% consanguineous marriage. And then you get up into <coughs> Europe, it's less than 5%, somewhere between 1% and 5%. And of course, many of the consanguineous marriages in Western Europe now would be from co migrant communities, such as the Pakistani community in the UK or the Somali community in London. Many countries of the world, we know that there are and these are principally in Africa, we know that 
many tribal groups do practice consanguineous marriage, but there simply are no reliable information on it. And that's a pity because in many ways, of course, the population of Africa is growing faster than any other population in the world. So it would be good to have this data, and even data you know, from Bangladesh, from um, parts of Indonesia, really pretty poor. So when I say that if you add all this together conservatively, 1,100 plus people live in countries where 20 to 50 percent of marriages are consanguineous, that, and predominantly their first cousin, that really is a very conservative estimate. If I was being pushed, I would say you're probably talking about 1,400, maybe 1,500 million people, something of that nature, which if you accept the 1,100 million figure, that equates to about 10.4% of the current world population. So there are lots of consanguineous marriages around the world. Now, switch on to the health issues. What do I think is going on? Well. My strong suggestion is that consanguinity will exert a significant advert in health via the expression of detrimental recessive genes whose incidence in the general population is rare. It will only have a major, a highly significant effect when you're dealing with a rare gene and that rare gene is brought together because the two partners have one or more past ancestors in common, and they've inherited from the ancestor. That's the style. So if the disease gene is common in the overall population gene pool, then consanguinity will only have limited effect on its level of expression. So you wouldn't expect consanguineous marriage at first cousin level to have a huge ill effect. It will have some effect, but the major effect will be with rare recessive genes. So really, in assessing this, and I'll go through some data now, and then I'll go through some, some case studies that we've been doing, I'm associated with in, in the Netherlands and then in, in uh, Brazil. First of all is the direct assessment of consanguinity associated with morbidity, and now you're looking at the prevalence of congenital anomalies, usually identified at birth. And the second one is to do a meta-analysis of consanguinity mortality at different life stages, such as stillbirths, first month of life, first year of life. And really data, sadly at the moment, on adult morbidity and premature mortality are very poor. But I'll just present a couple of, of early studies that we actually did a number of years ago on this. So what I was looking at was to get world data, and the world data had to be based on a reasonable sample size. I think the minimum sample size we were looking at was 750. Uh, cases, and there would have to be at least three types of consanguineous marriage or three levels, say first cousin, second cousin, non-consanguineous. And what we found out comparing the birth defects or congenital anomalies in first cousin versus non-consanguineous progeny, the mean excess in first cousin progeny was 4.1% with a median value of 3.3%. Surprisingly, the range was from 0.3% to 10%. So really, you do wonder uh, who was doing the diagnosis because um, it's very difficult when you've got a range of that size to worry. But, but it does match up with the figures pretty much, the median excess that you were talking about, Neil, just before lunch. However, there's always got to be a caveat because, of course, the more we do, the more work we do, the more we learn. And the better the techniques we use, the more discreet the techniques, the better the, the style of, of material we have. And this started as a result of a meeting I had actually with some guys from Germany. We, we met in India and I was giving a talk on cousin marriage, of course. And they came up and, to me and said, you know, we've got actually quite a lot of cousin marriage in Berlin. And I said, oh, yes. And they said, yes, Moroccans, Turks, there are big communities. And so we decided, well, we should go back and have a look at the data. So this chap, Rolf Becker, over a 20-year period, he personally did ultrasonography on 35,931 going on from 10-plus weeks gestation. Now, that's very important because virtually all the data, and even I think the data coming from Vaughan and Bradford, started at 26, 28 weeks. So to be able to go back to 10 weeks gestation means that you're seeing things going on in pregnancies that we simply didn't have data for previously. And all the examinations had been performed by Ralph, and we were able to find the fetal outcome data on almost 90% of 
these, these results. And to summarize very quickly, we called them consanguineous. It was 45% first cousin marriage, 55% second cousin marriage, and 62 out of the 568 cases he looked at in utero showed a congenital anomaly. Now, at 10.9%, what you've got to be very careful on here is that many of these cases, there was a strong family history, and there may well have been even one or two of previously affected children. So you're doing a prenatal diagnosis because you're pretty sure you're going to find something. So that figure of 10.9%, don't be too alarmed about that. But the interesting part was that 6.5% of these anomalies were autosomal recessive, 3.7% were anatomically complex, and just 0.7% were a chromosome anomaly, whereas in the non-consanguineous group, vanishingly few autosomal recessive disorders, anatomically complex disorders were a bit higher, and actually a higher rate of chromosomal anomalies, mainly due to Down syndrome. This was a maternal age effect. If you then present the data somewhat slightly differently, because what I'm looking for here now is intrauterine deaths, and remember, this is being measured from 10 weeks of pregnancy onward. And in the consanguineous group, that figure was 9.7% intrauterine death, as opposed to 4.9%. So we are picking up much earlier um, recessive lethals in the pregnancy period, and quite honestly, we are starting at 10 weeks gestation. Had we started at one or two weeks gestation, that's when I think we're going to be seeing the big numbers. I think we're missing them. So we, we thought we were doing well at 10 weeks, but we've got a lot more work to do. Neonatal death, 4.8% and 2.2%. So between intrauterine death and neonatal, you can see that the consanguineous groups certainly are at a disadvantage due, due to congenital anomalies. However, what also is interesting that in 50% of cases, a medical termination was carried out, or 60.9%. Now, most of these ladies were of Muslim background. In fact, I think they were all of Muslim background. And yet, they were agreeing in 50% of cases, or they asked for a medical termination of pregnancy. So even though you're dealing with much higher rates, once you take into consideration intrauterine death, medical termination, then you don't see such big of ill effects coming through in the postnatal life. To switch on to now mortality, and, and I'll just explain it briefly, what we did was to do a meta-analysis, recruited 75 studies, again, minimum sample size 750, minimum three data points. Approximately, we were dealing with five million pregnancies and live births. And there were 22 studies from India, two from Norway, 14 from Pakistan, one from Israel, etc., etc., etc. And what we did was to plot the points so you've got deaths in the first cousin progeny on the y axis going from 0 to 24%, and these would be infant deaths, so deaths in the first um, year of life, and going from 0 to 24 on the x axis. So in this case, it would have meant that in this particular study, it was about 19% deaths in infancy in first cousin progeny, as opposed to about 10% in the non-consanguineous group. We ran a linear regression, on-weighted linear regression through that, and we came up with a figure of mean excess infant deaths in, at first cousin level, 1.3%. R squared 0.75, so a very good R squared value, but highly statistically significant, even though it's only 1.3%. You know, 1.3% sounds big at the population level. At family level, it, it doesn't mean anything at all. But it's very important to get the figures and to be able to use the big numbers um, on these that these the meta-analysis allows us to do. So to summarize, in terms of prenatal <coughs> losses, in using this meta-analysis approach, we no significant difference. But had we been able to include weeks 10 onwards, we might well have picked up something significant. Stillbirths, 0.5% increase in stillbirths at first cousin level, 1.3% infant deaths, and from 28 weeks gestation approximately to 8 to 10 years, it was plus 3.7%. So comparing the mean difference between deaths in first cousins 
and deaths in non-consanguineous progeny going from 28 weeks to years 8 to 10, 3.7%, which is a significant figure. However, I should also point out, and, and it came up today, there was a, another question asked that I thought was quite important, and the point that Neil made, that in Bradford, I think you said that uh, in Bradford it's seven per thousand infant deaths. Um, could I point out to you that the average infant death rate in Pakistan is 65 per thousand, and approximately half the people being looked at in Bradford in the Pakistani community were actually born in Pakistan. So you've got to really take that into consideration as well, and often people forget about that side of it. Um, and, and that's why they come up sometimes with exaggerated figures. Now these are the two small studies that we did back in the 1990s. What we wanted to find out was, was there any evidence that cardiovascular disease, and this was the age of, at which they were diagnosed, would give rise to a mean coefficient of inbreeding that was much higher than the mean coefficient of inbreeding in the general population. And for cardiovascular disease, yes, there was a slight increase. You, but with a sample size of 825, you've got to be very careful. Um, kidney disease, maybe. Liver disease, no. Thyroid disease, no. Cancers, looks, yes. You're dealing with a mean coefficient of inbreeding of 0.049 as opposed to 0.0271. And when we subdivided the cancers, Breast cancer was the, the type of cancer that really came out. So there have been some studies subsequently conducted, and there does appear to be some recessive gene component in some breast cancers, but we would have to really, this work would have to be done again. And I would hope this is the type of work that will be done in the future. As people age in Bradford, you'll be able to do this type of work, and in some other studies in the UK that I'm about to mention. We then followed it up with another study in Islamabad on 1,107 cases of people with cardiovascular disease. The mean coefficient of inbreeding in the general population was very similar, 0.280. So again, all cardiovascular disease, a slight increase, but you wouldn't go wild on this one. Um, congenital heart disease, yes, an increase, 0.37, and you would expect it as a congenital anomaly. So that's what we would expect, rare recessive genes. Valvular uh, heart disease, ischemic heart disease, no. But when you break down the ischemic heart disease into acute myocardial infarcts in males, yes, you start seeing an apparent increase in the level of consanguinity. Males with angina, yes. Males with angina who are smokers, yes. So now you're dealing both with genes that may predispose towards ill health and <coughs> factors such as cigarette smoking that I think everyone except is, is going to give you an adverse outcome in terms of heart disease. So two other points. Moving along now, the health outcomes of consanguineous marriage. I, I first of all talked about the potential health outcomes but in measuring these health outcomes, is like being compared with like? Because many of the studies on consanguinity have been undertaken, <coughs> not surprisingly, by geneticists. Geneticists are not renowned for their capacity to deal with socioeconomic variables. They don't do that sort of work. Conversely, people like demographers don't, apart from Stuart, don't spend a lot of time thinking genetics. So you've got two people who are going along parallel lines and one saying, we find this different, so it must be genetic, and the other group say, no, it must be socioeconomic or whatever, whatever. So you've really got to be sure that you're dealing like with like, <coughs> and so you've got to be sure whether you're dealing with social, economic, religious, ethnic subdivisions. And as I'll show you in a minute, there's not much evidence of that. Um, and the other one from a genetic perspective in assessing the health impact of consanguinity in communities, is there adequate control for population stratification? What Neil was talking about, the clan or the tribe in Arab communities, the caste in India, or the baradari in Pakistani communities. And the first thing you say, where is consanguineous marriage most common? What are, what, are there any social or economic characteristics? And the first one is, it's most common in people of lower socioeconomic status. And to some extent, again, another question that was asked today, um, could it be that people will get rid of, of um, dowry 
Of course, one of the reasons to marry within the family is you don't need a dowry. A dowry is excused because it's a bit pointless giving someone a dowry when the money is staying within the family. So consanguineous marriages are especially attractive to poor people who poor people, particularly poor families, with perhaps three daughters to be married. That would bankrupt the family, even if they had enough money to know what bankruptcy was. Um, rural residents, mainly people, it's the highest rates of consanguineous marriage are in the countryside, low maternal literacy or even illiteracy, younger age at marriage and first birth, lower contraceptive usage, reduced birth intervals, longer reproductive span, all of them factors which potentially at least could give rise to an adverse outcome in terms of consanguinity if you weren't taking them into consideration. And the example that I've chosen is one that I, I just started working on a couple of years ago. And what I've done is to look at some Middle Eastern communities living in the Gulf region, Qatar, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Palestine, Iraq. Look at the inf current infant death rates. Look at the best estimate we have of consanguinity at second cousins or closer, closer. And then look at the mean per capita income. Now, as it stands, the highest rate of consanguinity is in Qatar. But Qatar has just got seven infant deaths per thousand, perhaps because it's got a mean salary of $133,000. Whereas if you look at Iraq, 37 infant deaths per thousand, it's actually got a much lower consanguinity rate overall than Qatar, but a much, much lower level of prosperity, of socioeconomic prosperity. So I think when you're starting to try to say that there is a relationship between infant deaths and consanguinity. The relationship between infant deaths and per capita, the inverse relationship, is much, much more convincing. So unless you control for socioeconomic status and all these other social variables, you're going to come up with data that almost inevitably will give you uh, an elevated risk rate ascribed to consanguinity. Now, the why endogamous population and, and uh, endogamous marriage and population stratification, in effect, where you've got rigorous uh, endogamy, group endogamy, as was demonstrated by Neil just before lunch, even in the present day generation, and certainly in the two past generations, in effect, each of these communities is a separate breeding pool. And if there has been a rare mutation, a founder mutation comes in, and people never marry outside their, their baradri, then the baradri alone will be the people who will show that particular uh, disease. And of course, if you ignore that and you just count up the number of cases of a particular disease and compare it with the total Pakistani, UK Pakistani population size, you'll be underestimating quite grossly the numbers in that baradri that is affected but with that baradri that is affected, you should be doing, making a big educational effort and concentrating your genetic counseling on that particular group. So it's very, very important that you get a profile of genetic variants um, because these profile of genetic variants can, can vary very, very considerably. And to give you an example of this, a paper was just published, I had nothing to do with this whatsoever, not that I'm washing my hands, I wish I had something to do with it. It's a terrific paper. It was published about, and it was called, Who Are the British? And it was on 2,039 people living in the English, Scots, Welsh, Northern Irish countryside. They picked people whose four grandparents had been born within a 30 mile radius, so they were fairly static. And then they compared these results with people across Europe. I'll just deal with the first bit. And the figure shows, I hope you can see it, that in the east of England, the southeast of England, going in the lower Midlands and down in the southeast, the same genetic types are predominating. And these would have been the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, etc., etc., etc. But when you move down into the southwest, there is a difference between the uh, Devonians and the Cornish. And the, the, I don't know, the Devo Devonians would say that. The Cornish would certainly say that. In Wales, there's a difference between North Wales and South Wales, and a difference between South Wales and Pembrokeshire. Little Wales beyond England, beyond 
Little England beyond Wales. And you get all of these, you see the Northern Irish, actually the so-called Dalriada, had invaded Scotland, drove the Picts up into the top right-hand corner, which is where the Picts remain. But the one that really gets me is if you look at the Orkneys, the Orkneys, 20,000 people, seven islands, and three different genetic clusters in just 20,000 people. And so what the authors said, and part of their summing up, was, you know, fine-scale genetic variation between uh, human populations is interesting as a signature of human historical demographic results and because of its potential for confounding disease studies. Unless you know you're comparing like with like, you're going to come up with a dodgy answer. And switching on to India, just to illustrate this, India, current population, well, when you say the current population, as soon as you say current population, it's, it's grown. You've, you've missed the last half dozen or 20. But 1.314 million, so 1.3 billion people, 29 states, 15 major languages, seven religions, 3,000 castes and subcastes, 1050 scheduled castes, 580 scheduled tribes. So a highly stratified society. And you would say that 90, 95% minimum are going to marry within caste. So it came as a considerable surprise. Well, it didn't come, I must admit, it wasn't a big surprise. I wrote a paper on this about 10 years ago that most people just ignored, but I'm coming back to it again. And this is data that I just picked out on the 15th of October from PubMed. And I looked to see where people were looking at an association study, i.e. between a genetic variant and a particular disease type. And there had been 9,193 such association studies in India. Only 1.7% of them had mentioned caste, and only 0.3% had mentioned consanguinity, even though 12% of the population of India are consanguineous, which matches up to about 160 million people. And in case control studies, 13,000, 0.9% mentioned caste, 0.3% consanguinity, clinical trials the same. People are doing these trials and simply not doing their homework. And the results they're getting from these clinical trials, which I'm sure can be run very cheaply and economically in India, are not going to be valid unless you compare like with like. And similarly with the consanguineous marriage, if one group are predominantly first cousin and they're in a particular caste and the other group are a different caste and predominantly non-consanguineous, you can't really compare them. It's pointless comparing them. And this fits in, I was in Amsterdam earlier this year to do a PhD uh, exam and, and was fascinated when I talked to some Dutch colleagues about a town, a little, was a fishing village, it's now a current town of 21,500 people called Follendam. And Follendam is all of 30 kilometres from Amsterdam. It's on the former Zuiderzee. It's, you know, it's not in the back of beyond. It's very close to a major metropolitan city. It was a Roman Catholic isolate in a predominantly Protestant region. Approximately 250 children are born annually, and two to four children are born with one of four severe autosomal recessive disorders. And these are the four disorders. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I'm aware of the time. PCH2, 14.3% of the population of this village of 21,700 people are carriers for this disease, which elsewhere in the world affects one to nine per million. So these are vanishingly rare diseases elsewhere in the world, but in this little village, which has been locked off through religious discrimination or self-locked off for four or 500 years, um, this is what happens when you've got a founder effect and the founder effect, the founder mutation, stays within the community. The, the sub-study was looking at uh, 203 councillees, and what they found out among these councillees was that 33% of the individuals were tested were carriers for at least one genetic disorder, and 7.7% for two genetic disorders. Now, normally people would look at these rare diseases and say, it must be consanguinity, but remember, this is a Roman Catholic community. So, there are no first cousin marriages. There are a few second and third cousin marriages, and only 1% of the people looked at were from outside the village. So it's a good example of extreme village endogamy, 
and you don't need consanguineous marriage. So when people say, all we've got to do is get people to stop marrying their first cousins and everything's going to be right, absolute rubbish. That's just a nonsense. Now, Brazil, I've been doing some work in Brazil. A colleague came to work with me from Brazil, northeast Brazil, about three, four years ago. And it's a very interesting country. And this is Bahia, right up in the northeast of Brazil. Um, it's a poor area, it's an inland area, it's very much predominantly white settlement. 52,000 is the current population size with about 1,200 births per year. 80% of the population lives in up to 200 different villages. So the villages, the total of 52,000 is the total population size. The village size can be 1 in 13 to 582. And what you find is that, and this is the study team led by my, my colleague Angelina Acosta and her colleagues, and they go out to the village sites. They, do, they started in 2006, they go out each year, they collect birth, death and marriage records because the Roman Catholic Church is quite st extremely strong there and has actually got very good records. And they get genealogical information, they collect blood samples, They've got the villages registered in GPS, and they talk to the villagers about genetic counselling, etc., etc. Because in this village, there are a whole range of otherwise rare genetic diseases that you certainly wouldn't expect to find in a population of 50,000 people. In particular, mucopolysaccharidosis type 6 with 11 different kindreds in this small community. And they've got PKU, congenital hypothyroidism, non-syndromic, deafness, 36 families, etc., etc. This is the, the, the typical cases of mucopolysaccharidosis type 6 with fusion of the spine and with abnormal facies, so that by two to three years of age they'll start showing these abnormal facies. It seems to be a very early onset form of the disease. There is a treatment for it, well, not so much a treatment as... How do I get rid of this, do I? Which is just appeared in front of me. Thanks very much. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, they, they can be treated, but the treatment stops the disease progression. It doesn't cure the disease per se. The treatment would cost 500,000 per child per year, 1 million US dollars per adult per year. The average family income in this village is $1,200 per year. So this is a tragedy for the village. If you look at the actual pedigrees, what you find, of course, is that in many of the families, you may have 12, some of them have 14, 15 children. It's a big, big issue with this particular family, or uh, this particular community. But the, the major point of, that I'm going to draw here is that the mean F value that equates to about third cousins. It's not as though people are actually marrying their close cousins. It's because the gene has become so commonplace within this community that you don't have to have cousin marriage, even though elsewhere in the world it would be a very rare condition. Why? Well, this is the interesting part, but local history is good on this one. The War of Canudos, from the 1830s onwards, a chap called Consigliero Antonio ran around the villages preaching the end of the world. The end of the world was going to finish. The world was finishing at the end of the 19th century. And he said, this is obvious because uh, Brazil has become a republic. Um, Brazil is now running censuses. You're having to register marriages. So it must be the end of the world. This is a sign of the end of the world. He set up a commune really with about 30,000 people and a lot of people joined him because of course they thought the end of the world is coming. So particularly if you've got some form of disease you want to be there when the end of the world comes and you'll be born whole again. And this is the guy, Consigliero Antonio and his, his bodyguard and the book that then came out of it was the, the War of the End of the World by Mario Vargas Llosa. It is available in English. I would strongly suggest to read this because I think we can pretty much explain the fact that the War of Canudos took place less than 50 kilometers from Monte Santo. And people who survived the war headed for Monte Santo, headed for, for some sort of stable place, and they brought their mutant genes with them. And I think that's what's happened 
in this particular grouping. So starting to wind up, which I'm sure you'll be quite pleased to hear, um, to me an overall reduction appears inevitable in consanguineous marriage because of urbanization for number one, with wider marriage pools. The marriage pools will, will grow, and particularly in places like China. China is actually an interesting example because the Chinese brought in a law to ban first cousin marriage in the Han majority. They're about 90% of the population. That was brought in in 1981. And I couldn't for the life of me see why they brought it in. Since 12 years previously, they brought in the one child family <coughs> policy and if you've only got one child, the chances that you're going to have a cousin to marry, and particularly with abnormal sex ratios, would have been very remote, but that's sort of by the by. Improving female educational expectations and opportunities with later age of marriage, changing modes of male and female employment, declining family sizes. Stuart has written it, his colleagues have written on this one. There will be fewer marriageable cousins. There just won't be cousins to marry. And the gradual adoption of the marriage norms of host populations by migrant communities, we may be seeing some sign of this coming in Bradford. It may well happen in the next generation. It will become much more apparent. But for all of those reasons, I think the numbers of, and the proportion of consanguineous marriages are going down. But the maintenance of cultural traditions, particularly in rural communities, cannot be underestimated. And also among first and generation migrants, from Asian and African countries where consanguinity is strongly favored. People, when they move to a new country, particularly a stranger place as Bradford, if you're coming from Pakistan, um, then you, you want to keep your family traditions around you because they give you strength. You, you know who you can rely on. My mother, you know, who has long since departed, always used to say, oh, when I said, why do I have to do this? And she said, because it's, it's the family. And But why do I have to do that? because blood is thicker than water. And as a child, I, I couldn't disagree that blood always did seem thicker than water, but I couldn't exactly get what she was talking about. But everyone thinks, you know, blood is thicker than water. It's very important to keep together, and particularly where there's political and civil instability in the many regions where consanguinity is traditional. And I've been working with colleagues up in the northwest frontier province on the Afghan border where the Taliban are very active, and the levels of, of consanguineous marriage overall have increased by about 15%. And there has been a switch from second cousin marriage to first cousin marriage. People are marrying back within their families. And the same thing happened when Saddam Hussein was on the run. He went back to his community. When Gaddafi was on the run, he went to his community. So I think it would be a mistake to underestimate the strength of this feeling, and particularly in rural areas. So the changing attitudes towards health as well, the impact of the global epidemiological tra uh, transition with a proportional increase in non-communicable disease states. So when people are actually told and are given a title, a disease, you have this disease where previously they wouldn't have had a, a, a description, there wouldn't have been a diagnosis, a child would have died without any diagnosis, now it's changed times. Rising health expectations in all countries really the shift from early death to extended morbidity that results from improved access or diagnosis, and community and professional uh, interest in rare diseases. This has been one of the big growth areas over the last couple of years. And just starting to finish off would be in the UK, what's going on? Well, there's a 100,000 genome project, 11 health centers in England <coughs> are combining on this. It started in 2014 and is due to finish in 2017, and um, it's, you're going to get whole genome analysis to be inducted on people with rare or inherited disease or cancers, or both, and of course you'll have your NHS health records to enable detailed phenotyping, disease phenotyping. One of the big advantages of doing this type of work in the UK. The second study, which was just announced about three months ago, is the East London study. The East London study is going to be very important. Again, this magical figure of 100,000 people has been chosen. However, it's slightly different, in fact, quite different to the 100,000 <coughs> genomes because it's going to be 100,000 adults of Bangladeshi and Pakistani origin of consanguineous parentage. And what they're looking for is a particular emphasis 
on genetic variation and the identification of rare knockout or loss of function genes. So now people are saying consanguineous marriages, um, they may be declining in frequency and we'd better have a look at them before they decline too much because they could be very valuable in identifying specific rare disease genes and therefore being able to identify the metabolism that under is underlain by these disease genes. So really, to sum up, I think the balance is, has changed quite considerably. The balance, to my mind, in pre-industrial and many agricultural societies would be the biological adverse effects are probably outweighed by the social benefits, particularly in poor communities, and particularly when people are used to lots and lots of children dying. It's very sad, but children, many children die in the first year of life. In Pakistan, it is still 65 per thousand at the present day. But when you move to an industrial society, then the adverse biological effects can be seen to outweigh the social benefits. And as people, particularly in places like Bradford or other cities, where people are being given a diagnosis where they knew there were children who had died at an early age in the community, in the family, but the child had died. You know, there was a chest complaint or there was some gastric complaint, but there was no diagnosis. Once you give a diagnosis, once you put a label on a disease, then it's quite different. And usually what you, well, often what you find is people say, well, we never had that in Pakistan. You know, as though it's a new disease that happened just in coming to the UK, but it does change people's attitudes and the biological problems really start to outweigh the benefits, the social benefits. And just to finish off, one slide is a little bit long, I'm sorry about that, but I thought it was worthwhile drawing to your attention because it was a statement made by Sir Archibald Garrod in 1902 when he was looking at alcaptanuria, the first of the inborn errors of metabolism. Uh, described, and he then gave the Croonian lectures in 1908, added four more inborn errors in. And what he said was, when observing that 19 of the 40 cases of alcaptanuria had first cousin parents, there is no reason to suppose that mere consanguinity of parents can originate such a condition as alcaptanuria in the offspring, and we must rather seek an explanation in some peculiarity of the parents, which may remain latent, i.e. in carrier status, for generations, which has the best chance of asserting itself in the offspring or the union of two members of a family in which it is transmitted. Transmission of disease, genes, recessive, mode of inheritance, carrier status, 1902. Perhaps we should send a copy of this to Baroness Flather and members of the House of Lords and require that they read this very straightforward and tremendously intuitive piece from Archibald Garrett. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the honour that I've had in addressing you today, and thank you for being such an attentive audience. Thank you so much. So now it's my great pleasure um, after this tour de force, um, to present you with the Galton plate. Um, this is a silver dish which was designed by Leslie Durbin, who um, designed the Queen's Head on the Royal Jubilee Medal uh, and the reverse of the one pound coins um, uh, in the 1980s. And he's also very well known for decorating the Stalingrad sword which was given by Churchill to Stalin to honor the citizens of Stalingrad. So um, he had a one-man exhibition in Goldsmiths Hall in 1982, and his work is now very collectible. There's, uh, there are several obituaries um, after his death in 2005, and there's a very nice one in The Guardian that um, some of you might be interested to um, read. I think last, time, last year I said to the speaker that um, it should be insured because... <laughs> <laughs> I think with my comments about Baroness Father, I'd better get life insurance as well. <laughs> <laughs> so before you um, rush off, um, so I, 
Uh, I uh, just want to say that we, uh, everybody needs to return promptly um, at half past three um, from tea. But I'd like the speakers uh, and the two organizers to come and be photographed uh, at five minutes before that at 3.25. So I think that was fantastic.